Okay. Hello, everyone who has braved the cold and dark of November. Um, welcome to today's ICD forum on secular governance in Central Asia. We're going to focus a bit on Kazakhstan today. My name is Lisa Beckman. I work as the outreach coordinator at ICD. And I am here today with um, three very distinguished speakers. We have um, Ulan Bigosian, who is a postdoctoral research fellow scholar at the School of Humanities and Social Sciences as at Nazamaya University. We have Opeke Dejan, who is former Swedish ambassador to Central Asia. And we have Svante Cornell, who is director of ICT. Uh, we will begin today's event by a moderated QA session on to questions from the audience. Um, and the context of today's forum is that ICP has a general theme of looking at secularism in Central Asia. We are currently working on a paper on secularism in Kazakhstan. It is not yet done, it will be coming out in the coming weeks. Um, first of all, let me say that if you're tweeting from today's forum, then you can tweet you should use our hashtag ICP and tag us. I would like to begin by asking Svante to tell us a bit about ISP's research on secularism in Central Asia. Um, maybe you can tell us how we should understand secularism and secular government policies in Kazakhstan and Central Asia and what secularism means in the region. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, especially to Vigorshin for coming all the way to be with us. Um, the, uh, I think the background to today's discussion is uh, in several areas. One is that we have been obviously working on this region, uh, on the security issues and on political development issues in this region for many years. Uh, but also um, we've at different times been working on the issues of violent extremism and, uh, and uh, radicalism in, in the Central Asian context. And some time ago, it occurred to, to us that uh, a lot of people are talking a lot about policy, state policies versus religion in Central Asia. And I tried to look if there is actually any kind of real research about what these models are. Uh, and I found that there is, there isn't, there is a lot of uh, opinion about what, uh, and well-founded opinion, about what the Central Asian states are doing, very often about what mistakes they may be making in terms of uh, dealing with religious freedom issues. Uh, but there is no, there has been very little in terms of asking the question, what are they trying to do? What are the intellectual, if any, antecedents of the policies? Are they similar across Central Asia to begin with? Or are there differences between the states? And uh, what, if any, uh, can we, if anything, can we learn from the experience of this region for the rest of the Muslim world, where obviously we have a situation where there is a, uh, a growing mixing of religion and politics. I think it's fair to say Turkey is the most obvious example of that. We see it elsewhere in the Middle East. And I guess, frankly, I think we can already conclude that this mixing isn't a very, hasn't led to a lot of progress for the development of these societies. Uh, now, given all the the, uh, and the Central Asian model, in which we, of course, should include Azerbaijan, is very much a work in progress. Uh, I think anybody who's been exposed to what these systems, are, what these political systems are doing, will find that there are policies that are not always very clearly thought out or very clearly defined. But I thought it's, uh, or we thought that it's, it's nevertheless important to look at where are they coming from, what are they trying to do, and uh, what, if anything, can be learned from these models. So you raised the issue of what secularism means, and I think here there is already a very important, uh, uh, very often a, 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 uh, a lack of understanding, uh, because when especially Anglo-Saxon scholars and opinion makers talk about secularism, they think in terms of uh, freedom of religion, uh, you know, the United States Constitution, uh, that the state should be neutral, the state should be uh, facilitating in, any, in all kind of ways the freedom of religion of its citizens. Uh, that's certainly not the model of safe secularism that we see in Central Asia. What we see, if anything, is one that obviously on the one hand derives some inspiration from the Soviet past, but also is modeled more on the French notion of protecting the state and the society against the ex excessive influence of religion. 
So I think that's where we have to start. We have to start by understanding that this is the, the purpose of these models. Um, and when you look, as we may talk about perhaps in the q and if you look in the Soviet, in the Soviet background, it, it seems to, to, to me that the Soviet era of uh, rel relations between religion and politics in the Soviet era are much more complicated than they appear. We think there was simply a wholesale repression of religion, whereas in fact, we, as we've seen in many other issues, including the manipulation of ethnic relations in the Soviet Union, we also find that the Soviet Union was very adept at manipulating religious groups against each other, particularly trying to suppress the folk religions, the folk Sufi Islam, uh, and instead to actually, both by default uh, and by design, to strengthen the more scriptural, the more orthodox traditions of Islam within Central Asia, including through Soviet religious institutions after the 1940s, which obviously left at independence these, these countries, not a blank slate, as is very often thought, but there were uh, Soviet-era policies that had a very strong impact on, if you will, the religious competition uh, in, in Central Asia and the Caucasus after. So looking at the region in the past year, um, a lot of focus has been on um, Central Asia as a breeding ground of um, violent extremism. Um, was it Benson, could you give us your view on this? Is this the case? Let me turn this on now. Yes, there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, it's a good question. Let me, my take on this, obviously, is that uh, if you look at this question traditionally, obviously, extreme varieties of, of religion in this region is perhaps not more prominent than in, many, in most other countries, I would say. Traditionally, as also started to say, Soviet take on this and the manipulation and so on uh, has uh, basically did for me mean that it was not prone to radical uh, religion or radical Islam uh, uh, as a tradition from the way of Hanafi schools and, uh, and uh, later on. It, I think uh, that goes for all the five countries, including Kazakhstan as far as I know. I mean, they have this uh, general uh, take uh, on this. Uh, when it comes to what happened later on when these countries became and won we want their independence. Uh, things may have changed uh, from there, obviously. I think that uh, what happened is that the religion, as Svante said, he said something about this uh, uh, to protect the state, obviously, yes. But I think also in the beginning that the states as such did not look upon this religion as the main preoccupation or to be the focus really. I have the feeling that they uh, uh, they thought religion can be taken care of, we have manipulated or whatever, we have our institutions, we just nationalize them and make uh, part of our national identity which we now are uh, going to, to build up. And I think they were not just afraid of, of this, uh, with the exception of some pockets of extremism, which had obviously been there before. I mean, we have the Fergana Valley, which is always mentioned as the hotbed of, of all these uh, extreme varieties. Uh, I think generally this was not what the leaders thought would be the danger for them. I think they had they wanted to concentrate on social issues, on uh, constitutional matters, nation building, and only with time uh, would they come into a new situation of policies, which which we then have seen being played out. Uh, so generally not, I don't think so. With time you have seen uh, things have uh, developed and you would have seen that d domestically perhaps this has not been the main driver of extremism from within. But rather when these societies opened up and with a new, very welcome, I would say, interlinkage with the world, also going back to a direct connections with the Islam countries we made in the Middle East. You see the, the airports where people are traveling and so on. I think they were welcoming also influences from all political issues, all the human rights issues, all the many things from the West and so on, but including also these uh, uh, religious uh, 
varieties and how to deal with that. I think they were more open in the very beginning of their independence. With time, that uh, obviously changed as well, and we will come back to that. Well, I think on the question of, um, of violent extremism, the, uh, the interesting fact about Central Asia as a whole is that we see a tendency of um, certain people of Central Asia background partly being involved in terrorist attacks in the West and elsewhere, and also a certain uh, quite sizable contingent of individuals with a Central Asian background. So first in Afghanistan, we saw it already in the 2000s, that in the late 1990s and later on in Syria and Iraq. What's interesting about this is that very few of these people appear to have been radicalized in Central Asia. Uh, almost all of the people implicated in terrorist attacks in the West appear to have led completely normal lives without any linkages to radicalism when they were in Central Asia. When they went abroad, either to the Western countries, Sweden, the United States, or for that matter to Russia, that is where this radicalization appears to have happened. And certainly we now have some data about Central Asian uh, fighters who have joined uh, jihadi groups in, in the Middle East, where we find that over 80% of them have been radicalized by labor migrants in Russia. So this is a peer, appears to be a phenomenon affecting Central Asians, but not one that is particularly taking place in Central Asia itself. That is, seems to me a phenomenon that is over, over, overlooked. Okay, so um, after this I would like to take it back a bit to the, to the Roots and ask Dr. Bigosian if you could perhaps define for us the traditional Islam in Kazakhstan and yeah. also perhaps how the government is building policies around it. Oh, yeah, <coughs> thank you very much. Um, first, I would uh, like to say uh, it's a great honor for me to be invited to my CTP today. <coughs> yeah, this traditional Islam, <coughs> I will not go to deep academic debates, folk Islam, traditional Islam, Sufi Islam. Uh, too much. So um, let's talk about <coughs> Islam, which I mean existed during the Soviet time <coughs> and colonial time. Uh, this heritage uh, uh, based on uh, let's call it Sufi tradition, but it will be quick questions about. I can explain more, but briefly, this is not the Sufism which you can see, for example, in Turkey. It's 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 different, and it was different probably before. Uh, colonization of the steppe. <coughs> uh, this uh, tradition, which was affiliated with uh, sacred uh, lineages, so called Khojas or Khojas, um, uh, associated with uh, shrine visitation, and uh, as Bruce Prevatsky in his book Muslim Turkestan wrote, that uh, associated kind of based on the cult of ancestors, on, on, on the cult of Arwaks, uh, ancestral spirits. This Islam <coughs> survived and uh, after getting independence, um, this form of religiosity now kind of flourishing. There is a uh, tons of uh, sacred places, uh, mazars, so-called shrines of uh, some of them renovated, some of them quite new. And actually, my whole research uh, was about a shrine complex of 19th-century Sufi saint and his descendants, uh, who are claimed as awliyas, as saints now. Um, so uh, it's like shrines, shrine state and sacred religions also in post-Soviet Kazakhstan. Where I argue is that actually it's interesting to see how local government, a so-called local uh, Akimat, Akimat in Uzbek, and Akimat in Kazakh, uh, how they kind of try to apply to traditional uh, Islam in their policy building. And you can see interesting mixture of uh, state-run nationalism, uh, Kazakh religiosity, um, and uh, definitely uh, in, in this nation building uh, policy, in, in, in this attempt to, uh, this uh, combination of religion and, and state policy, um, um, this attempt is based probably as a kind of answer on growing uh, or existing radicalization of Central Asian Muslims. Uh, is this uh, pol uh, politics successful? It's hard to say at this moment. Uh, but uh, what I would like to say, Kazakhstan as other Central Asian states, um, de definitely officials quite uh, uh, they, uh, quite surprised. They really they don't know what to do with this dilemma. It's, it's a big issue, and they st still try to apply. But uh, as answer to your question, yes, uh, it's definitely applied to. Uh, traditional forms of religiosity, but at the same time, for example, central Muftiyat 
time to time they may win some fatwas where they kind of telling them doing ziara and veneration of and asking support not from God, from spirits is not a good thing. But if you would compare how Muftiyat is, uh, for example, is against so called like takfiri Muslims, it's, yeah, definitely there is high level of critics of, of this uh, radicalized this kind of Daesh ideology, uh, real Muslims, and then traditional forms of religiosity kind of. It's understood they try to avoid this. This topic, and, and, and maybe they believe that the majority of Muslims in Kazakhstan will get enough of, the, of education they were abandoning, or maybe some, many Muslims are in It is part of being Kazakh. Thank you, and thank you so much for flying all the way to Stockholm. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> it was great. Yeah. Um, so, Ambassador Peterson, how would you describe their restrictions on religious freedom? Uh, well, formally, there are hardly any restrictions when it comes to legislation. Obviously, these are uh, have countries which have both uh, written into their constitution or various legislation that uh, or religions and <coughs> are, are free, and you are free to do that. Uh, they try to separate them, obviously, from the state, but that is not really also possible. So that is a mixture, I would say. Uh, but I think that um, when it comes to uh, Restrictions. It is a practical behavior by by state authorities, obviously, to try to restrict when it becomes when it is perceived as something which is uh, deviating from a line uh, that has been taken by the state. Because, as we as has been said, also, I mean, the states of the countries that I know obviously have also adopted Islam as part of their tradition. These are Muslim countries, obviously, and they, they are, have also welcomed Islam back in a way, but out of control, obviously. So they had hoped that they could continue this path and not uh, have it to come into more violent or uh, extreme uh, varieties. So I would say that that is, goes for, for the religions as such. Islam and, and, the, and the other religions. Uh, when it comes to the non-Islam religions, uh, Christianity, obviously, as we of course know that, that from tradition through the time of the Russian colonization and Soviet Russia uh, colonization, obviously the Orthodox churches have been very well seen. They have established themselves as uh, very respected parts and uh, partners in these countries, and they have also traditionally been rather loyal with the state authorities, more than perhaps Islam and groups of Islam that have been doing. Uh, and that seems still to be the picture in, in the countries that I know there, Orthodox Church. Then you would have uh, restrictions in practicalities when it comes to minor evangelical groups in Turkmenistan or in Uzbekistan and, and so on, less obviously in Kyrgyzstan, uh, but uh, uh, these are rather small groups by what we obviously also when I worked in this region kept an eye so to say and uh, focused our interest also in, in these groups. Formal restrictions very few but overall obviously this is a controlled area. Okay. Yeah, um, <clears throat> about Central Asia the growing in the case of Kazakhstan, it's interesting that the majority, we, we can say that many Kazakh stations they don't go and work in Russia, and as, for example, as our neighbors do. And, uh, so how they radicalized in the middle of, and sometimes it's, for example, there is a village in the middle of central Kazakhstan called Kirgir, where, which is just Kazgan, uh, uh, which is uh, during the Soviet period, the just was a uh, uh, mining area, uh, how people from Kyrgyz, uh, like a central Kazakh state, uh, how they actually joined like uh, these radical groups in Syria. I think a uh, big role played by global mass media. I mean, um, sometimes I'm, I'm joking, uh, joking like we have a WhatsApp revolution in Central Asia. You can see like people sitting on a horseback and calling his cousin who's studying in, 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 in LA somewhere, you know, really I saw this. So, uh, during the field work. Uh, definitely, uh, you, you cannot control the internet. I mean, there's many things which you cannot control. 
And for example, <clears throat> this kind of growing radicalization, I witnessed even like several years ago, um, I told Professor Smanta before that, for example, in 2004, 2003, there were the CDs of Said Bureski, which were practical, I mean, Said Bureski, the guy who was a Muslim preacher, the Muslim preacher who was killed by FSB in Tushetia. So, uh, and uh, CDs with him were, with his lectures, were circulated like practically from hand to hand. People were making copy and giving to each other. Um, and uh, yeah, there is a, there is some things which state wants to control but just can't. I mean, you cannot control people in the day. Like, I mean, even if you can control internet traffic, there will be other ways of getting this um, information. information. Yeah, um, so following up on that comment, um, since terror attacks in 2011 and 2016, Kazakhstan has passed new laws and regulations um, on religion. So, can you say something about these politics? Have they been effective or not? Uh, it's hard to say. <coughs> these laws and religious they appeared just recently, <coughs> and uh, uh, I left my I left Kazakhstan practically in 2011. I mean, I have been for a long time just for field work. Uh, my impression that when I came to Asana from May 2017. I definitely see less people who look like so-called Wahhabi Islam, I mean, um, do they went underground or do they scared of the state operations, it's, it's hard to say. Um, there is definitely practically a um, weekly news that such and such guy, people, guys were arrested and because they kept some information, I mean, they were spreading some Daesh uh, uh, Igil, ideology, and etc. Um, there was a news from South of Kazakhstan that some uh, heavy bearded guy, like a Salafi, was telling that we're tired of going to the police checkpoint every 10 days and showing our IDs. And uh, for example, in everyday life, time to time, when you go into the market and talk with Salafi looking guys, and they tell them, yeah, police is stopping us more often. And it was like several years ago, uh, or we just seen more often than regular citizens. So, uh, so uh, what, it's hard to predict what will happen, but what I see is kind of like a mimicry of food. And I, I, I don't know, I just, um, I'm not specialist on what's going on uh, with Islam in, in Muslim Africa. But uh, I'm a big fan of Vice channel on YouTube. And there's documentaries of uh, of, of uh, how Al Shabab was, you know, built, and uh, in, in Somalia, right? And uh, everything started. I mean, officially, everything started when the leader of the, of, of this radical uh, group was killed, and police and army destroyed the mosque. So, and its response there was a major uprising. And so it's how this Al Shabaab I mean, I'm not specialist, what I'm looking But, I mean, we don't have the situation in the country, but do we have people who are against the state, who are kind of keep some ideas and, and who are just afraid of leaving the country at this moment? Yes, we definitely, I mean, with the whole world now, I mean, we keep on I mean, with, in Russia it's so good what happened with a young guy who made the oath to. Islamic State in Syria by I think online. So this this terroristic acts can happen and uh, last attack in Almaty year, a couple of years ago. It was a yeah, guy who entered the police department and attacked and uh, um, and I think Kaz and not Kazakhstan state but Kazakhstan society in general shocked. People people still believe like yeah we bad things happen around the globe but we are like a post-Soviet area, we are defendant, you know, we don't have these truths, we don't have etc. But no, it's, it's different. It's changing. It's changing. Yeah. Okay. yeah no, just to add to that, obviously, that as I started to say also, I mean, what, uh, how generally populations have, have met uh, this type of, of violence, obviously, it is not anything that generally is accepted uh, by uh, this population. That is not the radicalization, radicalization yeah. that we are talking about inside these countries. Uh, and I think one 
perhaps should weigh in the what I understand to be the world picture among most of these people <coughs> today, obviously, uh, after independence, that is also that if they know nothing else, they know about very difficult situations in Afghanistan. They know about very difficult situations in Tajikistan. And when you talk to people here, <coughs> you talk about their uh, wishes to include Islam also in the natural kind of track here, they certainly know there are limits to what they, how they want this to see, that they would also, to a broader extent than I thought in the beginning, support state in trying to stop extreme violence in these countries. I've talk, talked about the pockets, there are always these pockets of hot, hot heads and so on, but I think generally they, they have learned also from, from neighboring areas that we have to be careful with this, and of course the states are using this against them and say we have to remind you about these dangers. I think also for some time when they were more open after independence and they welcomed also other schools and established financing and establishing of madrasas and so on from other countries. I think that also almost ended with a fear in these countries, because that were seen and perceived as extremely radical to, to, to many people there. It came too fast and they uh, saw perhaps the pockets grow uh, too much. Of course authorities reacted, but I think also many ordinary uh, Muslim citizens and citizens of other countries also reacted to this. And many of these schools obviously were closed. I mean, yeah. in Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, they said no more financing, we will do this on our own, we will have our own curriculum, we will do this over the state uh, uh, interventions by, by the respective states and not from abroad, from the other countries in the Middle East. Yeah, and uh, uh, also definitely, um, in, the, in, the, in the case of Kazakhstan, um, Kazakhstan state, finally recognize the importance of uh, Muslim spiritual board of Muftiya because in the last like seven, eight years I saw like definitely the work of Muftiya change. Even like Muftiya website, it's uh, for example like ten years ago it was I mean not working well for example and now it's like a daily news, it's uh, quite uh, easy to navigate inside, to get information, to download like khutbas mm -hmm. and fatwas. Um, also, just like if you go to if you go to Kazakhstan in mosques now, for example, in the 90s, uh, I was just a kid, and I remember like many imams were uh, just in some villages and some even cities. They just selected elder who, for example, barely had a barely knowledge of, of, of Islam or like could barely recite Quran, etc. Now you've got a new generation of well-educated imams. Uh, some many of them trained abroad in Adas Khan tradition. Uh, many of them kind of studied abroad and came back and studied in Kazakhstan. So, and the people at the age between 30 and 40. And uh, they definitely keep an identity of being Muslim Kazakh. So, and this <coughs> idea of, of sense of being Kazakh and Muslim, Muslim and loyal to state and being patriot, so of, of all land. So it's, it's kind of interesting mixture of religious, you know, how like religious nationalism in some sense. So, yeah, the uh, state finally decided to kind of use this good relation with the uh, spiritual world as is, is one of the main tools. Um, how it will succeed, let's see, in the future. Um, yeah, we just have how many? We will be more than 25 years of independent history. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so we keep touching upon the, the topic of radicalization. Um, but going back to the, um, the theme of today's forum, Sometimes I would like to ask you what role would secularism have in combating radicalization? I think the, there are several answers to that question. I mean, the, the most obvious answer is that if you don't have secularism, what do you have? And the problem that every state faces that is compromising on the idea of secularism is that, well, then it means that you're allowing the influence of religion upon state policy which means that you allow the influence of religious ideas on education and on the judicial system. One of the first problems that arises is which religion and which interpretation of religion. 
And I mean, that's why, for example, you find that in Azerbaijan is after the violence in Syria and Iraq, the country that has perhaps strengthened the secularism the most because it's a society divided between Shias and Sunnis. And they, the leadership there, faced the issue well, you know, if, if this spreads to our country, this could threaten social stability and peace in a very significant way. And therefore, there is no way to compromise because if you suddenly allow the Shia version to have an influence from your state policies, you're going to anger the Sunnis and vice versa. As for Kazakhstan, it's obviously a country where, compared to the recent history, ethnic Kazakhs are in a much stronger position of majority. Even 30 years ago, that was not the case. Uh, but still, there are large communities that are, first of all, not Kazakh, not Muslim. They are Russian, they are Ukrainian, they belong to other... I mean, and even among the Muslim population, you have people of Chechen origin, who, by the way, are not even under the jurisdiction of the Muftiyat, because they are Shafi Muslims and not Hanafi Muslims, generally speaking. So, I think we, should, we need to keep in mind that secularism has been... I mean, people have arrived at the idea of secularism for a reason, which is that if you don't have it, you open a can of worms which you don't really know what's going to, what it's going to result in. Another important factor, I think, is therefore that what, what secularism in practice means is that there, the education system and the judicial system is not based on divine revelation, it's based on issues like experience and reason. And that's an important, I think, for the ability of these countries to function in the modern world, which is also in and by itself something that, that has a effect of preventing radicalization. I think, however, what the more specific issue that these countries have had to face is that you can't, that secularism doesn't mean atheism. Uh, and especially because of the Soviet background, you have a problem that a lot of the religious traditions have been wiped away. <coughs> so that means that you've seen all over this region, uh, especially in Kazakhstan, an alliance between, if you will, the state and the representatives of traditional religions. And I think when Kazakhstani president even hosted, has hosted big international forums about the dialogue between traditional religions. It's not just a dialogue between any religious groups, it's between traditional religious groups. And I think we have to understand that with the fact that the Soviet Union, as so often was said, was a prison of nations, and it kept these countries, these republics, very isolated from the rest of the world. Suddenly you open up uh, the borders, this old state ideology has disappeared, and there is almost an avalanche of outside influences that come in. I mean, these, these range from Islamic influences from every kind of Turkish brotherhood, from the Naqshbandis to the Gulenists, uh, from South Asian Deobandis, even, um, even uh, Ahmadi Muslims, to, um, to, to Western political ideas. And many of them don't, but many of them do have political ideas, absolutely. And we've seen, for example, that the Gulenist, the Fethullah Gulen movement from Turkey was welcomed in many of these regions because it was a moderate um, and, and modern understanding of Islam. And then suddenly all these leaderships in Central Asia saw that this Gulenist movement was involved in some weird kind of power struggle in Turkey, and then they said, wait a minute, what do these people want? So you have this, uh, this is always a question, and I think the result of that is, and to that also should be added all the Christian movements from Europe, the U.S., but also straight, especially from South Korea, very strong influences uh, from churches that, that led these states to basically react and say, wait a minute, we can't have this because this is generating chaos. We have to go back and rebuild the traditional religious institutions that we have. So finding that balance is, I think, the, the issue right now, where the states are drawing the line of how much do you, so to speak, boost and uh, it's kind of a, like economic protectionism. Rather than protecting your industries, you're protecting your own traditional religions and allowing them to return and, prevent, and, and, and shielding them from outside competition. And you can see across this region that there is a wonderful dialogue and wonderful harmony between the representatives of the Orthodox Church, the Hanafi Muslim Muftiyat, the Jewish organizations. They all want to protect their own flocks against these outside religious influences, but they agree very well with one another. Uh, what's, the, what's the effect of this in the long run? I think it depends who you ask. But at the, uh, what, what I think is important is that we also should remember that many people, especially of the older Soviet generation and the leadership of, of Central Asian states, their understand, levels of understanding of Islam is very poor. And we see this, for example, in the fact that in, in Kazakhstan, in South Kazakhstan, there was a Kuwaiti-funded uh, university for Islamic education that was welcomed by the state. After a number of years, they suddenly start looking into what is being taught in this university, and they found that it's quite radical things that are being taught, and they actually close it down. 
Similarly, um, I, 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 I had the benefit of hearing an anecdote by Nakshi Bendi Sheikh in the United States 15 years ago who had visited Tashkent and asked to visit the, uh, the, 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 the Islamic University in the library and he went in and he looked at the books and he told his Uzbek host, do you know that you're teaching Wahhabism here? And they said, no, no, we created this university explicitly to prevent Wahhabism. And he said, well, look at this book, one, two, three, four. And they were all, of course, gifts by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And uh, obviously a lot of people did not fully understand what it was that they had been importing. So it's, it's, not, a, it's, not, a simple, it's not a simple situation. So uh, let's think of the topic of um, post-Soviet for a while. Um, Mr. Kisson, could you tell us a bit, do you think there's a, a post-Soviet Muslim model? Do all five Central Asian states follow the same policy? Well, I certainly by today would hope to avoid the term of the post-Soviet model. <laughs> I have left it, and I think most people have. These are independent countries with a national identity trying to build it up, and I have respected that fully, I must say. And these are different countries today. They, it's not a bunch of countries, it's not a group of countries. They are very into different policies as well. What I try to say is that the heritage, obviously, from the fall of the Soviet Union, that was rather similar, perhaps, you could see similar trends uh, all through, and I think they started that journey of independence by not fearing religion as such. I didn't think they had so many other things there. I think they were more afraid of political, <laughs> political demands. When it comes to, to freedom, there is freedom and human rights and so on, and it was not necessarily connected to, to religion as such, because that was also in a way control. So I think that, that is where they started, and uh, I think they were taken by surprise by this, uh, as Santa also said, by this influx. Uh, I'm not sure people have come from, from outside and sometimes rather humiliated people who say, Come, you don't know what you believe, you don't know how to do this. This is not religion as we think it should be. And you have been taught completely in the wrong way. And I think that uh, uh, was not only government representatives who kind of were taken back by this, but I think ordinary people. They were for either humiliated to say, my goodness, what is it? They may have gone along with this saying, my goodness, we have to change, and they may have become radicalized at some point. But I think the generally most people did not go there, and they have their remarks, and obviously it, 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 they had words said to them that this is also not the way it should, it should be. After uh, independence, obviously, they have gone uh, different ways when it comes to, to policies and uh, uh, I think that uh, normally uh, the greatest focus in my world has been the, the policies of Uzbekistan, obviously, uh, since that is the, the biggest country. It is, has a very tense, uh, dense population. It has it is known for hot spots all over. You have the Ferghana Valley, uh, as I said, and I think there you, of course, have seen the combination of, of policies that have tried to restrict. Uh, and, and as a, for a policy, but at the same time also working with uh, with the, the mosques, also finally, also still during Mr. Karimov's time, uh, to establish mosques and control uh, to control them. Uh, and that cooperation may have could have failed, but I'm, I wouldn't say that it has failed because I think also what has happened in such a country as probably in Kazakhstan, is still, despite what we think we will see of poverty and uh, mismanagement, you still have elements of progress, economic progress in these countries. It may have not reached out all over and to all, every, all and everybody, but it's enough, in my view, to persuade certain people that perhaps we shall not risk what we have seen so far. And we, are not, we have seen Islam also return in some way. Uh, and they are proud that they can be both of them. They can be proud of uh, secular education, perhaps, but they can also be proud to say that we have reconnected with the Islam world, and this is what we want to, to build together now. We will not risk it necessarily today. You don't have a critical mass, mass I would say, to do this. Yet. It may still come, obviously, but so far we don't see. When you see at infrastructure projects and so on in these countries, and including Uzbekistan, building this together for perhaps uh, for political reasons, military but it is rather impressive, it must also create an impression on people who live in that. In Faragana Mubali, when you follow the train line now from Osh 
through all the bend. When you go to Antujan, and when you go to Namangani, you go all the way up to Tashkent and to Urkic, uh, and down to Termes. Uh, I mean, it's not a society that stands completely still, and they are connected. These are not isolated in the way that we think they are politically and shunned by the whole world. They are not. And for instance, Korea is a good example. Korea and Japan are not shunned, at least. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, no, I think they have kind of been from outside the European Union and the OSCE area, the countries with full democracies that have somehow found a way to work with these countries not being disturbed perhaps by public and domestic opinions. Yeah, <clears throat> when we're talking about Central Asia and also the Muslim model, or even when we use the term Islamic Central Asia, my impression is that when we focus on religion, we forget about other things which go on in the region. I mean, in the case of Kazakhstan, I think um, just look to, I mean, we can criticize state for many things, we're just talking about it, but there are certain problems which work well, for example, the Bolasha program, compare the number of people who graduated from al and compare people who graduated, how, how many people graduated from American and British universities. Or look, for example, uh, this semester I'm teaching class <coughs> Introduction into Social Culture Anthropology, and a big chunk of my students writing papers about Korean K-pop. They taking part in Korean K-pop. They dancing, they singing. There's uh, students who are doing cosplay, they part of Comic Con Club. We had a crazy Halloween night. I mean, we have been, we have been to Starbucks near our university. <laughs> so, <laughs> How about this make possible by secular public, yeah. by secular system? Right? Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> I mean, there's uh, crazy startups are going on in Central Asia. <laughs> uh, like, uh, people going and starting Silicon Valley. I mean, when we're talking about Central Asia and Islam, I mean, there is, Central Asia is different. I mean, there's a bunch of countries. And even in one country, you can see different uh, groups of people. Yeah. So, um, picture is quite complicated. <laughs> yeah. There seems to me that there, Master Perez, in your rights, we should. It's it's time to retire the post-Soviet term. I, I think I agree with you. But I think there is a certain uh, Central Asian model in only in, if 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 only in the sense that if you look at the uh, the Muslim world in general, what really stands out is that only uh, there is there is only about 15 countries that truly have secular statehood, and half of them are in in Central Asia and Azerbaijan, practically. And that's why I think that's why I think what makes it <coughs> interesting because they have similar cultural traditions, and we should remember that this is not a periphery in the land of Islam. Very often, if you ask people whether streets of western capitals or even in the Middle East, they would say, oh, Central Asia is far away, it's on the edges of the Muslim world. Uh, what we know is that much of the, you know, the, some of the most holy books uh, after the Quran, uh, the compilation of hadith by al-Bukhari is called so because it was compiled by a gentleman from Bukhara in, in present-day Uzbekistan. And many of the, uh, of the uh, Islamic, uh, Islamic learning and science a thousand years ago was centered in Central Asia. So for people in Central Asia, as you mentioned, uh, people come from the outside in, in, a, in a quite humiliating way and say, you're not doing it right. Well, this region has a thousand year old tradition of, uh, of Islam. Now, of course, it depends where you are. In the steppes in the north, uh, this may not be the case, but Kazakhstan itself, if you look at the south of Kazakhstan, you will find that the, uh, one of, this was also one of the places where the, the Sufi Orders were born. The Naqshbandiya come from Central Asia, and the Yesabiya, of course, from Turkestan and presently Southern Kazakhstan. So there is a there is a, a strong heritage to build on. While at the same time, the states have all decided that we have to adopt a policy that separates the, the state from uh, from religion. Now, there are, as you, as I think you all pointed out, a big difference between these states, and that's that makes it even more interesting because it means that Central Asia is a kind of laboratory. And there are not so many, after Turkey is, you know, the climate of secularism in Turkey, uh, you're left with maybe Tunisia, maybe some West African former French colonies that really practice secularism. So this is a, a laboratory where you can see, for example, the Kyrgyz policies, more liberal, more open to outside influences. Now, especially in the south of the country, serious problems with radicalization taking place. Uzbekistan very often pointed out as a case of, uh, uh, that would be, uh, 
where there would be a radicalization because of repressive policies. We haven't seen any example of that actually happening. Kazakhstan walking a road in between, but also trying to build this relationship with Egypt, and especially with Al-Azhar through the Nur Mubarak University for religious learning. A new mufti appointed a few years ago who was trained at Al-Azhar and who worked at Al-Azhar. What will this mean in the longer term? I think we can. We, it's, it's a laboratory in the making which has uh, quite important um, lessons. Let me only add to that, obviously. And I agree with you to the extent that I would never protest against the five Central Asian states working together, obviously, to find common denominators, obviously. Uh, so, what I hope, especially now, in the last year, during still uh, the presence, active presence of uh, Mr. Karimov, this has proved to be difficult, not only perhaps because of him, but for the general constellation uh, in there. I think now I can see the opening up of this, but giving opportunities of working as the group of five states that I, at the same time, always have thought they have to work together. They have common challenges, and they have to somehow protect themselves, security-wise, political-wise, and so on. Uh, but doing that together within the community, the area, the associations that they did actually create at the very beginning, but would never find a function for these personality reasons. So I hope that is actually coming back, and then I certainly would be the first to, to support that way. They could strengthen each other today. Okay, looking at the time, it's almost time to open up the questions from my audience. Before that, I would just like to ask you, Dr. Bidojin, to very briefly um, say a few words about what the policies from Western governments, use another water adapter, should be towards secondarism and central Asia. <coughs> <laughs> Question. Uh, I don't know what to, I mean, I, how Western experience would be applicable to the Soviet area. It's, it's hard to say French model, American model, or really, I, I, I don't know, maybe Dr. Swanton will give a better answer. But um, in, in, in my, um, I my case, I mean, in my impression that um, Western centers of power, they try to stay neutral and they don't go inside and mess with the local politics. There's often time to time there is, uh, you know, the Jehovah Witnesses, I think, were banned in Russia. Oh, uh, well, well, well. And, and, <laughs> and uh, I think they also banned in Kazakhstan, but I mean, the time, yeah, but in general, yeah, I mean, I think it would be serious influence from of, of internal policy of, of, uh, of central Asian state. I mean, in terms of Kazakhstan, influence of Western states in terms of its own religion. Uh, I, I, would, I would say that there has been a tendency by, um, uh, by well, let me rephrase that. I think the, what we're seeing now in, in Central Asia, I think, is a big change compared to the recent past, where there was more of an attempt to stay aloof of uh, processes going on in the West or to restrict cooperation to the issues of economic cooperation, security, trade and so on. What we see more and more now is, especially in the two most important countries of the region, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, we see a, a, a real interest in economic and even political reforms. Uh, we see that, as, obviously, in Uzbekistan and President Rezioyev's uh, very uh, ambitious reform agenda. In Kazakhstan, we see uh, equally ambitious agendas from President Nazarbayev in the first in Kazakhstan <coughs> 50, the 100-point uh, strategy, and now the reformation of uh, the modernization of Kazakh identity that the president has been speaking about. We see an interest in, I think partly these are a result of the fact that for 25 years these countries were building and focusing on building their sovereignties and not so much interested in cooperating with each other. Uh, but what we're seeing, I think, now is that their sovereignties are more or less stable. And they see now greater <coughs> potential for working together. But they also, I think, we have economic changes with the fall of the oil price that have boosted these agenda for reform. But the interesting thing then is if you look at security matters and even trade matters. For many of these countries, China is very appealing. Uh, obviously, there is a strong relationship with Russia. But the moment you start engaging in economic and political reforms, there's very little that Russia can offer 
and there's not even that much that China has to offer. And again, the eyes begin to turn towards Europe. And I think that makes it important for, uh, for there's an opportunity, uh, there's a reform window, if you will, in Central Asia right now that enables Western countries to have a more constructive relationship. I think very often there has been Westerners, uh, Europeans and Central Asians have been talking past each other. Uh, and I think there's now a, an opportunity for calibrating and talking to each other rather than with each other rather than to each other, if you will. And I think the area of uh, how the state relates to religion is one of those areas. If there's more of a dialogue where people listen to what the Central Asian governments uh, are trying to do, for example, with the creation of a new ministry for religious affairs in Kazakhstan and so on, maybe then there's a better opportunity to actually have an influence over those policies uh, and to actually help these governments adjust some of these policies, share some examples or experiences from our own history and our own experience and then to, to help, try to help bring the situation uh, in, in the right direction. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, on that topic, obviously, I think, that, that, as you said, that is very right. But I think not being in a, working actively anymore, but in retirement, so I would think, obviously, the European Union has all reason to continue to follow the developments in these areas. And I mean, the European Union has to weigh it in comments about what they hear and uh, allegations and so on, because then they will continue to be. And I think we have to, uh, the EU has to find a way uh, how to deal with, with this. And in a dialogue, which has to be strengthened, I think. Uh, uh, but I think when we, when I was ambassador then in this way, I mean, we talked about cases, we talked about prison cases. That was somehow one way to measure things. And we looked back, when were these cases made, or filed, so to say. And what we could note, obviously, was that most of the files were went back when it comes to most political uh, prisoners in, 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 in especially perhaps Uzbekistan again, but, uh, but there were many religious cases as well. And certainly we do follow, we did follow, we did bring up. I've been sitting in lots of conversations with leaders there and we scolded because I brought it up at all. I mean, you shouldn't have to deal with it. You shouldn't come here you know, and bring it up with me. Those were comments. So after 15 minutes of arguing, you finally landed on a more, uh, a better way to discuss these matters, taking also what I said more seriously by the officials. This is what we will follow. It is not that detrimental to the existence of your state and your way of, of building a nation, but certainly you have to, to respect us as well. We are not. Not, not knowing anything or understanding anything about what's happening here. But I think that will probably have to continue, but in a more perhaps uh, elaborate way of finding constructive solutions to, 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 for, for, for both of these. But at the same time, as you have been indicating, uh, indicating respect for the sovereignty of these countries as well, I think that has perhaps at some times been perceived as uh, not being the way of. European Union officials coming there to, for discussions. Um, I think we have to open up to uh, two questions from the audience. If there are any, please raise your hand and my colleague Luke will pass around the mic. But I don't think I need the mic. We need it for the recording. Yeah, for the recording. Oh, for, the recording. <laughs> for posterity. <laughs> That's nice. Um, it seems like uh, you haven't covered that subject, but is Kazakhstan the most secular republic of the five? It depends how you define secular. Do you talk about the state or the society? Um, my definition of secularism is freedom from religion in the state. I don't know, I have never, I've never been in Uzbekistan, but actually, yeah, I, 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 as a Kazakhstan citizen and as a Kazakh, I think in the Kazakh society you still, or you, you have a niche where you can actually be free from, from religion, I mean, being Kazakh and not being Muslim, it's, it's, I, I don't know, especially in big urban centers, as Astana is Almaty, it's, it's quite common. My follow-up question on that, that is, why 
have these private republics succeeded better than Saudi Arabia or Iran in being secular? I well, I think they have tried to begin with, but um, the Saudis never really <laughs> thought about that. Iran, of course, is an example of an attempt to build secularism that went wrong. Um, obviously, I think it had, when the, uh, the regime of the Shah was overthrown, probably, I don't know to what extent that had to do with the secular character of the regime. Islam, and political Islam rather, is very often a, an ideology of social justice to try to, you know, uh, affect change with, a, uh, with that as an instrument of mobilization. Uh, but it seems to me that there was a power struggle between different factions and building on resentment against a certain regime that had to do with many things aside from religion. Um, now, what to, I think uh, probably a, a, I would include Turkey in your, in your question, if I may, because what we have there is an example of a country that for a very long time was a model, and I, I think for Central Asian states certainly was one they looked at in terms of how to, after the Soviet experience, when you get rid of Soviet atheism, well, what do we do now? Where, what can we look at? Turkey looked like a moderately successful country that was economically growing, that was also maintaining secularism. If you will, as many people from the former uh, Soviet states have, have said, we want to keep what was good from the Soviet Union. We wanted to get rid of the bad, but we felt that this, having separated you know, religion from the state, was a good thing, and we should build on that in a positive way. What we see now is what's happened happening in Turkey. Um, much like what happened in Pakistan in the 1980s and 1990s was that when the state loses its secular character, it also starts playing with, in its foreign policy, with, uh, with very dangerous elements. That's what Pakistan did, of course, in Kashmir and Afghanistan. That's what, uh, what Turkey started to do in Syria, but also in places like Libya and elsewhere. And we see a blowback. We see a blowback into the old society. Just what happened in Pakistan in the 1990s has begun to happen in Turkey back of radical groups that were using Turkey as a base and are beginning to organize in Turkey and targeting uh, Turkey Soviet. So I think it's, that also provides, in, in that sense, I think most of us would agree that the Central Asian states have been excessively uh, you know, cautious about uh, and nervous about issues related to religion. I think there are many things that you could improve, but on the whole, it seems to me that it's, um, it's an underestimated example of actually trying to uh, to avoid the pitfalls that so many other countries in the Middle East have been have fallen into. Yeah, okay. yeah and uh, there is uh, interesting tremendous changes going within Central Asia. For example, in Kazakh society. This year, I was surprised, like how uh, there's like a female students in my class. How many of them actually wrote their final papers about gender and gender certification and gender roles? You know, and uh, for example, why it's Bad for Kazakh girl to smoke in comparison with Kazakh boy, you know? and uh, the challenges there is there's interesting challenges are going within society. So um, and uh, yeah, globalization taking its toll. I just talk uh, Professor Swat, there is like a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu coach who is visiting Kazakhstan and giving belts to people. So <laughs> can you imagine? And you have one. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> so there is interesting things. I mean, um, and yeah, where is Brazil and where is Central Asia, right? Uh, so, um, there, uh, there is um, this complicated picture on the ground level, you know, and uh, yeah, you can go to the Rife University where people do like uh, studies of some blood cells and just a couple of kilometers, maybe some guys sitting and chatting and talking about fiqh and hadith and the habashids against takfiris, maybe some debates like this. Yeah, this is a tradition. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I have a question about uh, sectarianism, generally. Um, thank you. Oh, thank you for posterity. Um, you mentioned before, obviously, uh, Central Asia is an incredibly diverse area, both in terms of religion and in terms of ethnicity. And what we see in a lot of post-Soviet Central Asian states is that there's a strong association between religious affiliation and ethnicity. Um, sorry, this is a bit of a wordy question. But one of the trends that we see right now in the world of politics and religion is a trend towards sectarianism. We see it all over the place. We see it in West Africa, we see it in the Middle East, very, uh, very, very vir virulent form. We see it now in Afghanistan, increasingly. Um, and is there a risk that in Kazakhstan, a, a, a state which has really embraced having more than one 
uh, group of people and the sort of plurality of religion and ethnicity, um, is there a danger that a loss of secularism could lead to sectarianism? Yes, there is already some kind of uh, growing sectarianism, uh, sectarianism on the ground level. Um, the, just we have like a Hanafi school, and uh, this year I talk with the practicing Muslims as a talk. There is like a, of course a bunch of takfiris. Some of them kind of try to be hidden takfiris they, because the state is against them, and muftiyas against takfiris. There is like a like new some groups of Habashites appear. And there is like a group of uh, Sufis who call themselves like Jumnash Bandis, and uh, there is uh, some Muslims who are against uh, Gulen's uh, school and so on. And so there is, yeah, but <clears throat> again, um, the not, I mean, the majority of people are still secular or I mean, they're religious, the secular Muslims, if I would call. Uh, there is definitely, for example, the, I mean, you can see these people who are some of them state of, state officials, police, army officers. Uh, there is some restaurants in Astana where you cannot find alcohol and you have a prayer room. But the owner of the restaurant is wearing suit and he's shaved and he's uh, uh, I don't know like traveling abroad and all this. I mean, so um, um, there's yeah we have this. Um, uh, but a bunch of uh, leaders of uh, most radical them, I think they went underground, or they keep silence, or they already abroad. So in, in terms of state, uh, tries tries its best on in controlling this process. And to be honest, as an ordinary Kazakhstan citizen, we uh, in the, I don't I don't know what's going on actually in underground. I mean, there is probably some police reports and some things which. We just don't know. I mean, and it also kind of creates some turmoil in society. Like there is some arrests are going on, or some things happen, and there's a limited uh, amount of inf information usually provided. I mean, for example, the what happened with Kazakhs who went to Syria and joined Daesh? I mean, how many of them returned back? I mean, this is practically it's different statistics of uh, these different numbers. 200 Kazakhs took part, or 400 Kazakhs, or from what parts of Kazakhstan, I mean. And uh, public in general, they, they really don't know. I mean, you should Google it, you should go to states, website, and even there you cannot find a lot of information. So this kind of barrier, you know, of unknown, so, yeah, it's also awesome. I think to, to that question, the, uh, the processes that we've talked about right after, especially in the early years, but still continuing today with this influx of, most of the influx of uh, religious ideas from abroad are, are by definition sectarian because they, they um, propagate a different version of religion, be it among Muslims or be it among the Christian communities. Uh, that have been uh, that have been traditional in the country, which means that that process automatically leads to a pluralization, if you will, of religious of religious um, communities in the country. Um, and if in, and if so, you if you secularism, if you will, is the sine qua non, is the requirement for avoiding to have to take sides between these groups. So in a sense, I think over time we find that whereas the the uh, the original idea of the secularism of the Kazakh state has been to follow the French model, if you will, and protect state and society from a certain dominant religious influence. Well, over time, it may also be required in order to maintain a form of religious freedom from this main uh, tradition. Now, especially since we're seeing how uh, a muftiyaf that is, and this is not only in, central, in, in Kazakhstan, but in particularly in Kazakhstan, we see a, a muftiyaf that is trying to develop a model that is actually based on influences, in a certain foreign influence. I mean, it's based on an Egyptian influence, but at the same time trying to promote the Hanafi school. We have to see what that experiment leads to. But that is an adapted version, if you will, of the traditional religion in the country. Because it has the, uh, an, an, a, the Hanafi literal, the, the, the Hanafi clerical authorities are very anti-Sufi very often. They're not at all very tolerant of <coughs> Sufis. Now, they are much more critical and much more against the Takfiris and the Salafis and other groups. But they are not very tolerant of the traditional folk Islamic ideas. This is a scriptural, you know, book-based Islam, not a folk, a Hojab or a Nishan-based 
type of religious tradition, uh, which is also going to mean that it's going to be, it may be difficult for, the, uh, for these other communities when the state has to, on one hand, maintain a neutrality, but on the other hand, it's also dealing with a muftiyat that is issuing fatwas. Now, if you have a secular state that has a muftiyat that is issuing fatwas, now these fatwas don't carry the rule of, they're not legally binding, but they are at least an indication of what the state authority thinks is the right form of Islam. Now that is also, in the future, uh, a, I think that's a challenge for the secularism of the state. If that Muftiyat becomes too influential, we can see that in Turkey. Uh, what's happening in Turkey is that the state religious affairs directorate, which was originally intended to control Islam, is now being used to, because there is an Islamist government, to amplify and to define what Islam is for the population. That is an issue where I think Central Asian authorities have to be very careful. On the one hand, encouraging the resurgence of the traditional religious institutions, <coughs> but on the one hand, not going so far that they actually enshrine a certain form of Islam as the sectarian correct path. Oh, sorry, thank you. Yeah, and uh, um, if you just imagine, like, yeah, I was only fan of him, uh, Mashab in Central Asia, and everybody were happy now. This is like a should be in the book. Debate Musulmanski Bogoslov. There is a like a collection of letters uh, written during Soviet time. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, Hindu Sunni and his opponents, and there was already different like Muslim uh, schools which uh, debated with each other within Central Asia. And uh, also, I'm sorry, Doctor Swade, uh, but this uh, divide between North and South, like our South is more religious. Uh, in North, actually, for example, Alfred Bustanov is doing research about Islam in Siberia. There is a mm -hmm. tremendous amount of documents are coming from Tatar villages, which is like uh, were mixtured with cousins from Omsk and Tomsk area. For example, just um, in summer 2014, I was traveling from in Pavlodar region, in old area, and I was surprised that practically almost every Aul has uh, uh, memory and preserved it that tears and hand notes by the grandfathers, which actually uh, Qurans brought from Turkey during Hajj in 1910, or some uh, pieces, some uh, fatwas and dawahs handwritten, some of them even written in Farsi, which is quite interesting, not just in Turkey. Uh, there is um, Alan Frank research uh, done about uh, uh, Vilmani, a uh, big uh, scholar who even my granddad actually witnessed him, he's from Akmolitz. Sharia oriented guy who would be during Soviet time. So, North Kazakhstan actually has quite uh, interesting own uh, heritage based on written tradition, too. Which, which is, came from very much related to Kazan, right? Uh, uh, and Kazan, and, and also interesting, and, and Hiwa, even. Mm -hmm. um, for example, uh, Alan Frank found that some Kazakhs of Altai area had uh, close relations with Ugench, which is interesting, right? Uh, uh, and the uh, connection with Turkestan area definitely. <coughs> but interesting, and, um, and for example, when there are many Salafis, I mean, uh, with Alfred Bustanov actually, we talk about what language Salafis use in Central Asia. Do they use mostly Russian? Are they kind of more Kazakh speaking Salafis? I mean, 10 years ago, I think Salafis were speaking in Russian mm -hmm. because majority of books were, come, were coming from Russia, translated from, from Arabic into Russian. And Ibrahim, uh, Ibrahim Publishing House, I think it was called famous <laughs> in Moscow, which was central in Moscow. But it's, it's interesting that uh, uh, my impression that still, yeah, we have Kazakh speaking Salafis also, but uh, many Salafis actually they're descendants of Kazakhs who settled down during starvation, industrialization, and collectivization in big cities, and uh, they become highly Sovietized and Russified. They're like fourth, fifth of generation of Kazakhs who was born in this industrial micro district, mm -hmm. uh, micro rayon in Russia. And during the night, there is high level of poverty and they become abundant. And it's like, you know, like American last now. So you, if you will make and compare some areas of Kazakhstan, you can compare with American Detroit. And this kind of things happen. And I think definitely there's identity crisis at home. And, and these guys, they don't belong to the Kazakh speaking so called traditional village culture. with veneration of ancestral spirits, and at the same time they don't go to Muftiyat's uh, uh, hutbas, mm -hmm. which go in Kazakh because they don't, uh, they don't feel that they're highly connected. So and they go to sources which are available in Russia. And in the early 90s, early 2000s, the sources were, many of them were offered in uh, Salafi, which I mm -hmm. Thank you.
running out of time. Oh, yeah. oh, we have time for Sorry. Yeah, well, I think uh, more questions if possible. <laughs> yes, we have <laughs> three minutes. Sorry, just to find it. <laughs> please, any, do. Any questions? Please. Um, I also see that we have the ambassador of Kazakhstan in the audience. Do you have a, a question or a comment for us? Well, uh, uh, my gratitude. Uh, Thank you very much for uh, organizing this, uh, this uh, seminar um, and uh, uh, especially I uh, appreciate that, that you uh, mentioned the Kazakhstan in the theme of the discussion uh, and uh, I'm sure that you uh, selected the case of Kazakhstan not because it is the easiest as President John Kennedy said but because it is uh, not the, uh, it is, uh, the, it is more, maybe the most difficult in centralization, not because it is, we have serious problems, but be, because Kazakhstan is a very diverse society, and uh, as uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, all of you, that uh, uh, we have not only uh, Muslim, but a substantial part of our society is Christian. And uh, I, I uh, especially, I, um, I'd like to Thank you for, for uh, uh, arranging this event uh, in, in Stockholm, here in Stockholm, because it is extremely important to uh, inform uh, the society, the local public, the uh, mass media. Uh, I, uh, uh, I think that there would be more people here, uh, though uh, it is for Stockholm. And, this number of people, of course, is uh, quite impressive, uh, but uh, there are a lot of events uh, in Stockholm uh, going in parallel. Uh, so, uh, again, this is very important because um, all of you, uh, you have uh, 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 deep knowledge of the region. Uh, the Dr. Uh, Svante Cornell is a frequent visitor of the region, and uh, of course, our master of Kepetrusson worked there, and uh, uh, Dr. Tuan Pigorzhan simply lived there. So, <laughs> From me. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, and um, uh, uh, but, so I, I have to uh, say that sometimes uh, we, when I read newspapers, not only uh, in Sweden, but uh, other Western. Um, in the, the countries, uh, it is easy to notice that people uh, sometimes wrote the articles uh, and uh, they do not have uh, enough information or uh, they didn't uh, 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 so they uh, had to uh, get to do more uh, uh, substantial research. And, uh, oh, and for example, if you Google uh, Kazakhstan, well, I don't, I didn't do it recently, but uh, some time ago, for example, you uh, uh, may find uh, some criticism uh, on, uh, for example, on attitude of Kazakh government to uh, some minor uh, Christian uh, groups other than the Orthodox Church, for example. And by the way, uh, Ambassador, uh, I uh, thank you, Ambassador okay, uh, Peterson, that you mentioned about, uh, for example, evangelistic uh, uh, group. So, uh, but uh, as far as I know, the, uh, in, in case of these small, uh, smaller groups of um, Christian uh, Christians, uh, it is uh, rather simple. Uh, uh, in Kazakhstan, we have a law that all. Uh, Religious groups, uh, uh, they have to be registered according to the law. But, uh, but some of such groups, they simply do not want to deal with the state, with the government. It's the, the, uh, uh, one of the kind of. Uh, uh, it's in, in the, uh, so, uh, well, you understand what I mean. So, and, uh, and that's created a problem. But it is not that because the uh, Kazakhstan government is focused. They, uh, on that very uh, small peaceful group of uh, uh, believers, 
It's uh, because of the law, and uh, I, uh, I hope that you understand why we want the law uh, should be registered, um, uh, given the security uh, situation. And, uh, uh, so uh, that's, uh, 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 that's what should be understood. For example, by the way, uh, I just, th this evening I, uh, uh, this afternoon I remember that uh, in my small center I, uh, I worked in, in Almaty, in Kazakhstan, and, and uh, uh, we had an NGO. And uh, uh, in a while I uh, found out that one of the members of, of our team, uh, she's actually, she was actually uh, as a cousin. She belonged to the Presbyterian Church in, in Kazakhstan. It's quite unusual. This was like uh, 15 years ago. So it's, but it's uh, it's okay. So nobody uh, <laughs> uh, uh, tried somehow to punish her. Or, so it is not Orthodox Church. So uh, it's uh, it's okay. That's a fact. That's a, uh, such a small example. And uh, also. Uh, I, uh, uh, I also uh, would like to thank Dr. Kronov that uh, you mentioned about the initiative of our uh, uh, president of Kazakhstan, uh, our state, uh, about the uh, Congress of uh, Leaders of uh, Traditional uh, Religions in Kazakhstan. Uh, it's, uh, uh, we uh, convened it every three years. And uh, again, it reflects the uh, diversity of our society, and uh, of course, it's a, a matter of um, uh, uh, that Kazakhstan would like to contribute into the uh, to the uh, strengthening of international security and through uh, inter and uh, religious dialogue. So, uh, and uh, I'm afraid that we five minutes. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, of course, I would like to tell more, uh, but uh, thank you for, uh, for uh, giving me the, phone, uh, the microphone. And uh, I'm uh, looking forward to uh, read the forthcoming uh, paper. And uh, this is uh, just recently we, um, I uh, uh, I, I read a very interesting uh, uh, paper by the ISDP. Uh, uh, probably you, uh, some of you picked it up uh, at the entrance uh, about Kazakhstan in Europe. So, and uh, uh, it is extremely uh, informative and uh, so, uh, and, uh, and this, uh, uh, by the way, I, I, I felt myself as a, um, uh, this afternoon as a student, actually, <laughs> yeah. and uh, uh, in front of uh, professors, so, <laughs> so and uh, uh, I, I hope that I will have time to, uh, again, to, Watch and uh, uh, listen to you, and uh, it's uh, it will be available uh, online, I believe. Right? Yes. Uh, good. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, I hope that uh, the same will do other uh, uh, in, in, uh, people, especially from mass media and uh, uh, from a scholar community, academic community. So, thank you very much again. Thank you so much, Master. And, and, and thank you for bringing Ulan. <laughs> yes, that is all for today. So thank you so much for coming, everyone, and we will. Uh, we hope to see you again at future seminars.